so you know mainly the cryptography is used to provide several security requirements so that they are what in uh, integrity confidentiality authenticity and non repetition so the objective of the lecture today is to uh, understand how do you use cryptographic algorithm what we call it as hashing algorithm to provide the data integrity right so what are the hash algorithms hash algorithms con condenses arbitrary messages to the bit size so that is how what has do so there are some set of algorithms called mac algorithms that Uh, message authentication for the algorithms so those algorithms we will discuss in this discuss it in soon so hash we first discuss the hash algorithms hash algorithms are mostly used to store the passwords it also used to check the integrity of file system it also used to create digital signatures one of the latest application of hash is cryptocurrency so like that we have we can see different different applications of hashing so in order to understand this hashing we will first see how those hash functions works in this side what you have is uh, the messages or what you call it as the keys and on this side we may say this is hashes they are codes so hash functions are some kind of mathematical functions which match map these keys into those codes so this point you know we have a whole set of messages a whole set of messages on this side what we have is finite set of codes so with the hash functions what we try to do is map this infinite set of messages or into finite set of code when you try to do that obviously you may understand there may be more than two messages which created the same code so that is call it as hash collision so if this number of messages are larger and if the number of number of hashes are larger and number of messages also larger we should not be able to find such hash collisions in the real time but basically there might be the collisions we have to design design this hash functions in such a way people should not be easily find those collisions so if i summarize so far what we discussed we have some functions called a hash algorithms so we have the data that is our messages we feed those messages or the data into this hash algorithms then those algorithms create a code is in other words we we kind of uh, reduce uh, this message into the code so by feeding this code back to this hash algorithm we should not be able to get the message actually we can't so in the cryptographic algorithm we learn on the first day we can they can be reversed that you regular cryptographic algorithm we feed our data our plain text to that we get the cipher text we feed the cipher text we get the plain text but in the hash works not like that so we have the message we feed to the hash algorithm it create the code we feed the code to the algorithm but we cannot get the message so that's why we call hash functions are one way functions so we can consider x operation or as a simple hash function so as you know i introduced verlum cipher at the beginning so the verlum cipher could consider as a good encryption algorithm however as a function we are not considering as a good hash algorithm instead of there are several hash algorithms we are using to our day to day application so some books call hash algorithms as fingerprint as well some some says it is digesting algorithm whatever the the name it is so what those algorithm do we feed the message in algorithm represented by letter h when you apply hash h to the message m it create a code in other word 
it contains a variable length message to the fixed length fingerprint, fixed length code. So those algorithms are public, similar to any cryptographic algorithm, hash algorithm are public. In the message also, we feed those message to the algorithm, it creates a short code. So when you calculate hash, we don't have any sacred key input. So it just feeds the variable length message to the hash function, it creates the fixed length code. So that's what it do. When you think about the design consideration of this hash function, the most important consideration is this. Basically, uh, hash functions can be applied to any size of message. It produces the fixed length of code. So the other main component is we should be easily calculate hash of this message, but hard to calculate to reverse it. So that is one main property of hash. The other is, it is, it should be infeasible to find x and y equal each other. That means it is infeasible to find passage for x and y which create the same hash. So, if we can find such x and y, we call it as collision. As collision. So, the, our hash function h should be designed in such a way, infeasible to find x and y which creating the same hash. That is the most important requirement of hashing. One of the popular hash algorithm in the world is called Massage Dynast version 5. So that's algorithm designed by famous cryptographer called Ronald Rivers. He is the person, one of the person who invented other cryptographic algorithm called RSA. We learn RSK later on. So, Ronald designed this MD5 category of hash algorithms. So, the latest series of MD5 is uh, message digest. MD5 refers to message digest. Latest version is message digest version 5 or MD5. So, this MD5 algorithm takes variable length of code and condenses into 128 bit hash value for the short code. So unfortunately, this MD5 hash algorithm has broken. So there are several crypto, uh, research papers you can find in the internet where it explains how MD5 can attack. So in, in principle, how it works, uh, I will explain. You can read the slide, but I will explain with the diagram. So how it works is basically our message usually divide into 512 bit data blocks. So obviously when you have a message, we may not have multiplication of 512 blocks. We, if in that case, we have to add some dummy data at the end of the message. So this process is called as a padding. So we have a message we tap and make into the uh, 550, 512 data blocks. So then what we do, we take each block, we take first block and feed to the MD5 hash uh, method. And it also take uh, some fixed initial vector. So then after we process those data, with those initial vector, it create a 128 bit hash code. So that code will feed to the next block together with this theta. So it will continue. Final block will produce the final output that is 128 bit hash value or the what we call it as 128 bit digest. Some people call it as fingerprint as well. Some people call it as a fingerprint of the message. So I have said that so those MD5 has broken. So there, was, there is a demo published on the website. You can visit the link here down uh, to see the detail. I will show you some demonstration at the middle of this lecture, why I say it broke. So alternative algorithm for MD5 is secure hash algorithm, or SHJ. SHA algorithm or the secure hash algorithm, some people call them as SHA algorithms, has several 
varieties, set of functions. So when you think about the properties of those SHJ algorithms, so it has the same property. That means we need to be easily calculate HX. It is difficult to reverse it, and we should be able, we should not be able to find X and Y which create in the same mesh like that. So how it works similar to MD5. So if you have a message, again here with this is J1, uh, we have to, or we should also divide into 512 bit blocks. So each block we need to feed it to the hash algorithm. And then obviously there is initial vector we feed it, and then output of the previous one take it to the take it as an input to the next round. So like that we continue until all the data blocks are over. So output of the last operation considered as the digest or the hash value. So SHA, SHA family or what you call a secure hashing algorithm family has several versions. One of the version is called SHA1, version one. SHA1 has 160-bit hash values for the digest. So in addition to that, there is a one called SHA120, SHA256, SHA512, and so on. So when I start, if I, let's, let's summarize what we learned so far. We learned two kind of hashing algorithm, what we call SHA and MD5. So they have, MD5 has 120-bit hash values, SHA has 160-bit hash values. So basic operational unit of both algorithms are 512 bit. Then they have some number of internal rounds of operations. And other important factor is MD5 algorithm, we can feed infinite messages. And uh, SHA1 algorithms, we can feed messages which has this maximum size. In addition to do these two uh, standard algorithms, there are so many other industry uh, related hashing algorithms available. So one of them I listed here. What are the applications of hashing? As I mentioned, one of the main applications of hash algorithm is password. So we use hash to save passwords. Uh, before then, so we, let's discuss how somebody save password. So basically, people will create the password the you people are the users who are going to prove his user X to the server. So when, when we creating the user, we are saving the username and the password in the server. So at the time of verification, what user has to type is say web key or escape. That is his password. So after user type that, that application will transmit that to the server, escape. So then it verifies whether this SK is equal to VK. SK refers to secret key. VK refers to verification key. Verification keys are stored in the databases at the backend servers. So how do we go to store these uh, verification keys uh, on the servers? Obviously, we must keep this verification key as secrets. So usually, Typical method of storing them is so we have to have a user table in the backend servers, it has the usernames on one side, the passwords in the other side. So, obviously, it's not a good idea to store the plain text password. So, if you store the plain text password, whoever who access to the database or the user table will see those passwords. So, then they might misuse those passwords. So some people might suggest, why not you store encrypted password? Storing the encrypted password is not a good idea as well. Why? All the encryption algorithms has another input. So that's what we call as a security key. So if you store the encrypted password, we have to store those security key as well. In that, say, in that case, we should have another table in the backend database called key table. So those key table that might contain usernames and the uh, uh, key table might contain the security keys. 
So then it's not a good idea because uh, then we have obviously encrypted files. And since there are keys also in the table, so some attacker can take those keys and decrypt those passwords. So the keys are not the recommended method of storing those passwords. Recommended method to store those passwords, or what we call it as verification key, is hash. So what we do when you use, when user create a password, we calculate the hash of this password. So we store those store this hash of the password in the user tables. So then, some, some in, in, then when the user wants to log in, what's happened? When user wants to log in, uh, what's happened? User type is sacred key. So this sacred key transmit to the server. Server calculate the hash of the sacred key and they check whether this hash of the sacred key equal to the verification key stored on the server. So what we store is the hash of the passwords. So if someone see the user table, they may not see the password. They may only see the hashes. So by looking at the hashes, people may not be able to get back the password because hash functions are one-way functions. So however, there are several problems in this method. One of the problems is if we look at those hash values, so attacker may be able to identify similar hashes. If the attacker see two hashes are equal, that means those these two users are using the same password. So that is not a good thing. So for example, if we know the one with the password, we can be able to use the other user account as well. So that is not a good thing. So we have to find it out then with that so or overcome that. So other problem with that, with this storing this plain hashes is what we call it as dictionary attacks. So you know in the world, most of the people are using common passwords. So they might use the password in the dictionaries. They might use the popular words in their languages. So then what attacker might do they will calculate the hash of all known words in the uh, all known words. So they might store those words in the big tables. So then if they want to break the passwords, so what they do, they run a simple search query. So if, let's say attacker get access to the password table, they might see hash of the user password. So they take the, those hashes and search those hashes in this user tables or the pre-calculated hash tables. If they match, if they get a match, what that means? That means the uh, equal words in that table can be used to create get the same hash. Then that word can be used to log in in behalf of the same user. So in other words, we should we what what we need to log into someone's account is a word which equal to hash of his password. That word may be his hash or maybe some other word creating this hash. So we need to overcome this dictionary attacks and this uh, and also we need to overcome uh, identifying the similar passwords in these password tables. How do you do so? So for that uh, we are storing additional column in this user tables, what we call it as salt. So then uh, standard uh, proper user tables look like that. It have the use ID and salt value and hash of the password plus salt. We are not only storing the password, we add the salt to the password and calculate the hash of that. So then even though these passwords are equal, since those salt are different, we may not see the similar hashes in the table. Similarly, if the same password, we can have multiple souls. So if someone want to calculate all possibilities, it's become a huge table. So, however, some people try to create such huge tables, consist of different words, their combinations, and their hash values. So those tables, call it as 
uh, rainbow tables. So, however, adding the salt to the user table, it's a good idea because that creates little difficult for attackers to recalculate or the reverse the uh, passwords in those user tables. So if someone wants to do so, they need a lot of computer power and they may not be able to pre-hash dictionaries uh, to do that because for each word, there are different sources added. So other popular application of hash is to provide the authentication of the evidence. You know, nowadays we are using digital evidence uh, in, in order to prove a lot of criminal cases. So those evidence we call it as electronic evidence. So gathering those electronic evidence, processing those evidence, uh, considered as digital forensic. You know about it. So in order to kind of in the area of digital forensic, in order to provide the chain of custody, we use the hash values. Chain of custody refers to giving the authenticity to the evidence. So for example, if some, let's say some police arrest a criminal with some electronic evidence, that means some photos or maybe some files. So then later on, the police may present this evidence in front of the court. So in that instance, the criminal can argue the police officers may manipulate those electronic evidence because if the evidence are in electronic form, anyone can alter them. Anyone can maybe change those. So then police has to prove in front of the court so they did not alter those evidence. How did they do so? How do they do? So the, the best method of doing it is hashing. So usually in the forensic practices, we say in case we are, in case we kind of seizing evidence, so what the police officers should calculate the hash of those electronic evidence. They have to create a, a document with the files they kind of seize and their hash values. So then they make two copies and ask the criminal and the officers to sign. So then we have a, a document with hash values. So later on, if some conflict occurs, so the police officer can recalculate the hash values and show them, show the judge. So these hash values don't change, or these values, hash values are same hash values at the time they collected those evidence. That proves, that technically proves, no one altered those electronic evidence uh, during the uh, kind of during this uh, court case. So, so that hash is very useful. So this application is called authentication of evidence. Similarly, there are so many applications of hash. So one of the latest application of hash values are cryptocurrencies. So in the cryptocurrency hashes are used to make the authenticity of this distributed ledger. So I'm not going to discuss that in this class because otherwise it may, uh, uh, we may need kind of a lot of time if we are going to discuss cryptocurrencies. So let's move instead of uh, some practical activities. So basically, I mentioned that there are websites which claims we could reverse hash values. So however, those websites are not reversing hash values, they do hash reverse lookups. What that means? It means they are looking up or they are searching pre-calculate databases to the known hash. So such a website is given here I will show you a demo in a minute and let's see how do you calculate hash values. So in order to see how to calculate hashes, so I will use my terminal and demonstrate it to you. So I, I hope everybody who participate in this class are familiar with 
need Linux terminals. So maybe you can use any terminal, Debian or whatever, Red whatever, whatever. So maybe Ubuntu terminal is also fine. So I will uh, demonstrate uh, those in such terminals. Uh, so those people who are not familiar with the terminal, um, maybe they can use a virtual machine or the VM, or maybe they can use a Docker. So I guess all of you are, some, most of you are familiar with the Docker and the VMs. Anyhow, what we want is the Linux terminal. Uh, so I will show you a simple demo where we can calculate hash values of files. To that, I will uh, share my terminal. So you see my terminal. So there I will go to a directory called Uh, by the way, all the files I am demonstrating will be uploaded to the repository which I have given. Some of you already got the copy of this repository. So after you get the copy of the repository, I'm continuously updating my main repository. So actually this uh, new updates may not reflect it to the repository you kind of get it. So because of that, you have to check the main repository which I, be, which I shared with you. So those repository, I will put it uh, all my slides, uh, programs, and the files. So you can freely access them. So in the GitHub, uh, there is a repository which I shared with you that are the additional resources of those uh, class. So you can freely use those resources for your activities. Right. So those who are not familiar with the Docker, so I will show you how to create a Docker image because sometimes uh, in, you might use Windows machines. Whatever the machines you use, it's fine. You can uh, install the software called Docker. Docker is a virtual, uh, virtual kind of a lightweight virtual machine, we can say, so where we could use to create uh, some uh, instance of the image. Let me let me share my. Uh, uh, let me show the. Okay. Right. Let me share that. So let's see with uh, the uh, yeah, let's see. Um uh, this is my browser. Uh, okay. I'll share my desktop. That is convenient. Right? In this desktop. So you see my browser here. Uh, this is my browser. Right? So you see Docker. Uh, Docker is kind of a software where you can uh, use to install your applications. So maybe what you should do, if you don't have access to any 
uh, Linux prompt, you can install this Docker in your uh, in your desktop. Then after that, you can create what we call it as a Docker file. I will show such file. So it's called it as a Docker file. Docker file. In this Docker file, if you want to get a Ubuntu prompt, you can say we want to install Ubuntu. It's say from Ubuntu. And you, this is uh, this is just my name. You can omit that. After that, we using the run command. I can tell which uh, which application which I want to install in this Ubuntu uh, VM or the lightweight Ubuntu. So then it say I install get apt get update. I update this Ubuntu instance and I say install open SSL. So that will install open SSL on the Ubuntu. Open SSL, SSL is one of the famous cryptographic library in the world. So most of the websites, uh, web servers, and most of those operating systems, Linux flavored operating system, use open SSL for its cryptographic operations. So I create a lightweight Ubuntu image only with the open SSL to demonstrate activities in this class. So you could use uh, this file called Docker file to create the same image. After you do that, what we should do basically, uh, you can you can uh, run the uh, Docker command called uh, build. So uh, those commands I have given in the file called Docker txt file. So this file. So both files I will upload to the uh, GitHub. So what you should do, you download these two files, put it into the folder, uh, like here. So you see this is in these two files, and first you run uh, this command for this docker build. Right? So that will build what we call it as a docker image in your computer. Like that. So first time when you run it, so it will fetch the Ubuntu lightweight image from the internet and it up, do all updates to that and it install open SSL on that image. So that will create a simple uh, lightweight Docker image. So when you run that, the command is docker build minus t and give any name for that, that is the image name and dot. Dot refers to the local Docker file in this current directory. Right. After you run that Docker file, you have to create what we call it as a Docker container. So for that, this is the command. You run this command. So actually when I run that, it got an error because I already run that and then create an image on that. Uh, create a container. So maybe I will remove my old container on the machine. So to, uh, to confuse you, we'll just clear the screen, right? Okay, this container is running. So I have to stop it. Uh, don't confuse all those steps. I clear them. So first you have run, I will do from the beginning. First you run this build command, you want to do it only once. After you build that, you need to create a container out of this image. For that, you need to run only this command. This command says, create a Docker container with name of the container is Ubuntu. In order to create that container, use the OpenSSL image which we created. So most important part of the Docker image here is this. So it's not like VMs, when you create Docker containers, we can map the local file system. You know, when you create a virtual machine, it has the isolated file system. There are no direct connection between the VM file system and your host file system. In the Docker, we can, when you're creating the Docker container, we could directly map host file system into the image. How do you do that? So we say using minus V parameter, we say which, which 
directory we want to map. So for instance, sorry. For instance, what I do, what I tell here is map the current directory. So this is the home directory. Tilde refers to the home directory. UCC refers to the file system in the host directory. I say map it with the home directory of the image, right? So when I then, after creating that, if I go to this home directory, I can see the files in the host directory called UCSC. So minus V command will map the home directory into the local file system. So I name it as Ubuntu image, and in order to create that, I use open SSL image which I have. So this is the format. Using that, Docker run, map the uh, UCSD to the home, name of the container I'm going to create is Ubuntu, image I'm going to use is open SSL. You might see I get the uh, root from Docker Linux or the Ubuntu. So it, it is a Ubuntu file system. When you change the directory to your home directory in this, you can see the, my local file system and the UCSC, all the files there are, I can access. So I'm actually in the local file system, I am under uh, this directory, ORG, uh, so this is the current directory. So if I uh, kind of split my window, so, so I will, this is my local file system. So in the local file system, I go to this directory, CSC, ORG, BD, BD, run, cryptography, and crypto. So you see, this is my host system files, and this is my Docker image running. So this is the Docker image file. You see the same file system. But here I am accessing those files as a Ubuntu system. Here I am accessing those files as a Mac system. So same file system access using two different operating systems. So, so I'm, in order to show how hash works, I am use Ubuntu system. Right. So you see there are some files now. So for example, in this directory, uh, I can create some files. So I will create some uh, file called text. Okay, maybe it has, maybe I use here to create the file. Uh, uh, maybe text file. Uh, it has this content. See that? So when I see that, I can see that file also here. Because I'm working on the same directory. Right, so I want to calculate hash of this file. So in the, how do you do? In the Ubuntu or the Linux operating system, there is a command called md 5 sum. So I can say md 5 sum and test. So you see, it creates the hash. So this is the md 5 hash value of the file called text. Right, so let me now alter this file. Maybe I use here to alter it. So maybe I add some other word and save that. So then let me calculate hash value back. So you see this hash value is different. So this is the original value before alteration. This is the new value after the alteration. So you see that two different hashes. So the hash detect the alteration. Similarly, I can use uh, other hash algorithm. Like Let's say I'm using a, a, a one hashing algorithm. Come on, for that is SHA one sum. Right. When you see SHA hashes, it is 160 bit low. So MD5 hashes 120 bit low. So you see this is larger than this. So this is SHA hashes. The hash goes depend on the algorithm. Size also depend on the algorithm. It not depend on the message. Right. 
So let's say if I want to calculate hash of the old files in this directory. So then I can use MD5 stuff. So you see it's create hash values of all files in this particular directory. Right. Let me see. I want to later on see whether someone alter this one of these files. So then what I should do is save those hash values into a text file. So how can I do that? I can use Linux redirects commands. I say MD5 some redirect to some file called hash. Right? So then this hash file contains the whole hash values of the current directory. Let me show that. So when I say cat hash, so you see all hash values stored in this file. So later on, if I want to see whether any alteration, I can run the command called md 5 minus c hash. So you see it so tells us this files are okay, nobody altered. And this file has changed because hash just created, it's changed. And others are okay. This test file is also okay. So let me now alter this text file. So I just add the enter key and save this file. Sorry, maybe I uh, save this file like that. Right, and then I run test cover. So you see it identify this alteration and it say test fail because I alter it here. So you see hash detect the unauthorized alteration. Other thing you might notice, hash in order to calculate these hash values, they only consider the content of the file. They may not get the uh, file name and file, file uh, creation times like the meta information of the files. It only take the file content. So for example, I quit here and make a copy of this text file saying test one. Right? So then here you might see there are two files called text and text one. They are two different names, but contents are equal. So we can identify that by calculating hash of those two, two files. Let's run MD5 sum uh, star. So you see this is text file has this hash, text one has this hash. That means two files has the same hash. That means they have equal content, right? So even though file name is different, that doesn't matter because in order to calculate hashes, they are not considering the file name. They are only considering the content. Right, so that's how we uh, create the hash and test check these hash values. So I, as you remember, I said MD5 system has broken. So I will demonstrate that. Uh, let me go to some other directory. Uh, let's see where I go. Uh, Mm. Right. Okay. Uh, so there you see some files. Let me go to the same directory here. So I have at the root. I go to home. Uh, this directory. So basically, both system on the same directory. Right. So now you see there are two files in there. One file is called erase, one file is called hello. Let me calculate if we find some of all files in that directory, right? So here you see the hash of hello. Look at the hash of erase. So there it is here. Hash of erase, maybe I calculate independently. Um, hello, in the file, uh, erase. So you see, so there are two files, uh, the hash content is same. That means 
this should these two files should have same content. That means they, these are two programs and it should have same content. So let me run these two programs and demonstrate to you that. So I will run my hello program here. So it's a hello castle. It's two programs written by me. So then I, I run the other program erase. You see it says press enter to so erase your hard disk. So when I say enter, it say it's erasing my hard disk. Actually, it's not erasing my hard disk because it's just printing that. It's these two programs are written by me, myself. So you see these two programs have two different content, two different executables. But you see there are two hashes are equal. What that means, so somebody has created this. In a way, they're having the same hash. So that is really dangerous. Because software I must use hash values, MD4 hash values to distribute the software. How do they use it? So they usually publish the hash value of their software on their websites. What they call is that fingerprint of the software. Why they publish that? So usually after download this software, we have to calculate hash values and then check whether the hash value published on the website is equal to the value we calculated. Why we should do that? So because that during the download or due to some bad activities, some you might download malicious software to, which has some viruses or which might have some uh, malware integrated to that. So we can detect such uh, uh, modified software by looking at the hash. Some attacker can modify the software and still make that software to create the same hash so we are in trouble so that's what we do it here so however if you use SSH hashing here we can identify that these two files are different so let's let me show that so i calculate here SSH1 sum erase and SSH1 sum Hello. So you see, I use SHA algorithm to calculate hashes, then these two hashes are different. So then SHA algorithm correctly identified these two are two different programs. But we when you use MD5, they, they, they tell us they are equal. So that is wrong. So, so that's why I say MD5 is broken. Don't use it. So use SHA family of hashing algorithm as much as possible. Right, now I will demonstrate you how to calculate hash of a word. So if you want to get a word, a code which in the terminal, you know there is a command called echo. When I say echo fashion, it will echo on the screen. But you see it's go to the next line. That means it added the new line character here. So if you don't want to get this new line, I say echo minus n. So you see it's echoing this fashion on the same line here somewhere, right? So, so, so if you want to calculate a word of the hash, what we do, we say echo minus n and type that to the hashing command like that. So this dash is Linux 5 command. So you say MD5 sum like that. So this command, sorry, MD5 sum. So this created the hash of the word castle, right? So then, let me try whether we can whether we can reverse that. For that, we can go to the hash reverse lookup websites. So there are plenty of such websites. I might use one of these websites here. Let me see. So I take this. So, right. And I share, let's go to that website, and then I will share the website. Maybe I will share my desktop. Uh, desktop. Okay. You can see my desktop now. Uh, here you see the website. So there are several hash reverse lookup websites. 
they are not really reversing the hash values they have pre-calculated hash values stored in their databases when you put a hash here they search their database and pick the word which create the same hash they have they can we can try with different hash algorithms in the world so you see in the terminal i have created the hash of the word cousin let me copy this into this program like that and say reverse so you see they correctly reverse my hash so i input this hash values and they re say reverse immediately they say this is cousin so that means they know uh, this cousin create this same hash how do they know because hash values are one way functions but here how do they know they know the word cousin beforehand and they have already calculated those hash value of the cousin and they store that value in their database so because of that when we try that hash they immediately tell it back similarly we can try to reverse hash of the passwords using those such websites so obviously in order to do that they should have pre-calculated hash value of our password stored in their databases right so that is what they do it here is basically reversing the hash they do the reverse lookups not doing the reverse calculation of hash values right okay now let's move on the lecture and discuss what is message authentication code message authentication code is similar to the hash only difference is so it used the additional input for security key so when you have a look on this so you see this is the message we feed into the message authentication code algorithms it code the fixed length of code in addition to the message it usually do the second input so that is called as a secret key so this map is depend on the message and the secret key so also the mac are the one way algorithm that means by feeding the mac we cannot get back the message but feeding the message and the secret key we can get the code so when you see the properties of the mac algorithm its mac algorithm also conveys the variable as message to the m but the code they create it depend on the key so since we are sharing a key between the sender and the recipient so somebody is in the middle may not be able to reproduce those codes without knowing the key so that is very important in this scenario so so i will skip this slide for the moment and discuss this scenario using this slide right so basically what happens here so this is how we going to transmit messages many uh, in security protocols use back algorithms to check the integrity while they transfer in the data or the messages so there what we do we have a message feeding into the back algorithm and it also we feed the security key so we will create a hash or the what we call back which depend on this key and the message so then we attach that into the message and we transmit to the other side so when that message reach to the other side we get the message and obviously other side must know the key how do we going to share the key between the sender and the recipient we will discuss later on so the other side what happened they add the security key and the message they receive and calculate the mac code for message authentication code again so they receive the original code and they compare it with the new code if both codes are equal we know no one alter this message during the transmission or message or the mac during the transmission if these two are different we know someone has altered it so then as the recipient we can request the retransmission so 
in case we use hash instead of Mac, what happened? At the middle, attacker might change this message. And after he changed that, he might recalculate the hash and replace this hash values here. So then the recipient will receive altered message and altered hash. So then when they verify that, it gets verified, so then he may not be able to detect the alterations. So if you use Mac instead of hash, what happened? Attack at the middle cannot create this without knowing the key. So since that key is only shared between sender and recipients, attacker do, does not know the key, so he cannot recalculate this. So then only the recipient can verify that. So that's why MAC is important during the message transmission. So it helps to uh, preserve the integrity of those messages. Whether so when you calculate the MAC, 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 there are pure MAC algorithms or message authentication code algorithms. We will learn such algorithms later on. Instead of, we will learn today how do we use hash to create a map. So when you use hash to create a map, that is called HMAP or the hash map. So hash functions are generally, it's good functions, are simple functions uh, to calculate hash values. What we want to do is add the key to this map, hash calculation. And the key to this hash calculation. How do you do that? Obviously, we can concatenate the key to the message and put it into the hash value, hash function. Then obviously we get keyed hash, right? So we are not arbitrary concatenating those key values. They are our standard of doing it. So otherwise, the recipient doesn't know whether we add this key to the front or whether we add this key to the end, and so on. So if we add to here, we get different results than adding here. So because of that, we need to calculate this HMAC or what we call HMAC in the standard way. Standard describes how to add this key into the message. What we do, we add a security key into the message and then after that, this keyed message feed it to the hash. So then we ended up with the keyed hash or what we call HMAC. So there are different criteria where we created this HMAC. Basically, HMAC simply to combine the key to the message and feed that message to the hash function. So then traditional hash function can be used to calculate MAC. So basically, how do you com combine these hash values to the MAC, hash values key to the MAC, a uh, key to the message is actually using XO operation. So we have XO operation, you know, basically we do XO, we do XO and the key until this message is over and get the result, that result will put it to the hash and the output is hash map or what we call H map. So in order to do this calculation, we can use any existing hash algorithm. As I mentioned, in addition to that, there are few MAC algorithms. So those MAC algorithms can be used to create the MAC as well. So, so when you consider the security of those hash or the MAC, so there are two different attacks. Let's say HMAC. So HMAC has two kinds of attacks. One is called glucose attack, other one is birthday attacks. I also mentioned in my first lecture, any cryptographic algorithm, we may have glucose attack. That's why I said all the cryptographic algorithms are computationally secure algorithm. It's depend on the computing power. When the computing power get increased, some of these, our, some of our cryptographic algorithms may become obsolete. So, so that is common to all cryptographic algorithms, so that's common to HMAC as well. So in addition to that, these MAC algorithms may have some attacks called birthday attacks. So in order to understand what birthday attacks refers in cryptography, let's try to understand the concept called birthday paradox. 
this point the paradox is a very very interesting concept which discusses on the statistics so in that concept it says uh, so in, in, in the, we can discuss it in a simple question so the question we, we, we want to discuss is how many people must be in the room to get the same birthday greater than 50% of the problem that means if you get a classroom how many people should be in the classroom to get two people having the same birthday right so when you try to solve these cryptographic problems, some people say it is kind of a two, uh, two, uh, two over 365 because there are 365 days in the year. So that is wrong. Actually, what, what we try to do is mapping any pair. So I'm not asking, so any two with the birthday January 17th, instead of I am asking any pair, any two or pair which equal, any two equal pairs. So that is a very interesting question. So when you calculate that result of this question and plot that probabilities, you may end up with such graph. So in this side of the graph is number of people. This side is the probability of pair, probability of getting similar pair. As you may see, this is 50%, 0.5 probability. So in order to get 0.5 probability, we need to get only 23 people. That means if there are 23 people in the class, there are 50% of the chance having two people same birthday. You can statistically try that and also you can think about your school classes. So if that class has 40 people, so definitely there are two people having the same birthday in this class. So when you carefully watch this graph, you see if there are kind of 60, 70 people in the class, there is a 100% probability that two of them having the same birthday. So what is the match between this birthday paradox and hashes? Because so you know in the hashes, let's say this is number of people, that is kind of number of messages we, we observe, and this sign, let's say probability. So hash has a fixed size. So for example, MD5, the length of the MD5 hash is 128 bits. That is maximum number of codes we can see is to the power 128 bits. So that is the maximum number of codes we can have. So with this birthday paradox says, in order to find two equal codes, we need to get this number of messages. So for example, 1.18 to the power of 2 to the n divided 2 number of messages, if you can tell it, there is a 50% of probability two codes or two messages are equal, or two hashes are equal. So in other words, so what attacker can do, attacker might collect the period of, collect the messages over the period of time. They just record those messages together with the hash. After they have collected the hashes and the messages over that, there is a 50% of the chance we will get a message which the hash we previously received because if there is a matching pair. So if attackers see a matching pair, pair what, that, what they can do is they can replace their new message with the old message. Because those two messages creating the same hash, they can replace the new one with the old one. So then the recipient may not detect it because both have the same hash. So in order to do that, as an attacker should listen to the network for a considerable period. So the amount they want to collect is this much of data. So that is the relationship between birthday paradox and the hashes. So in the hash uh, calculation, it's called it as birthday attacks. So there is a math algorithm called CVC math. 
So we will discuss later on given with any Mac algorithm, any hash algorithm, any HMAC algorithm, where the attacks are possible. Right. In the last part of this lecture, I will discuss a little bit how do you calculate, how do you use Java to calculate uh, uh, hash values. So in order to do the cryptographic operations in the Java, there is two, there are two cryptographic packages available. One of the package is called as Java Cryptographic Architecture or JCA. JCA consists of all cryptographic implementation. So the Java implement cryptography as a crypt provider class. Java has different security providers. Security providers provide the security features to the Java platform. So Java comes with default providers. If we want, we can add other third party providers also into the Java virtual machine. So those providers consist of different security engines. So security engines implement security algorithms. So those security, some of the security engine classes are random number generation engine, message digest engine, signature engine, cipher engine, message authentication code engine, and so on and so forth. So in those engine classes, we will discuss about message digest and message digest stream class today. So these two classes are the classes which we use to calculate hash values. So other name for hashing is message digesting. We also use the name called fingerprinting for this. So Java used the name called message digest. So message digest is equal to the hash. So both are the same. So in order to calculate hash or the message digest, we, we can use two different classes in Java. Though they, they are called message digest class and message digest stream class. Message digest class used to calculate the message digest of a fixed given set of data. Message digest stream class used to calculate the message digest of a file stream or the network stream. So today we will discuss only message digest class. So using the message digest class, how do you calculate a hash of the message? For that, first of all, we need to get the object of this algorithm. So all the cryptographic algorithms implemented in the Java as static classes. You may see the difference between static and the regular classes. You may know the difference. The regular classes, if you want to get the object, we have to create this using the new keyword. So in the Static classes, we don't need to create an object using new. Instead of we can use the class name and call the method name. So for, ex for instance, the message digest class are the static class in Java. So we say message digest not get instance and give the algorithm name. So then this 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 method will return the object called message digest object. So you can use any name for that. So using this object, we can update our data to this algorithm. So by calling this, we get the implementation of SHA algorithm. So if we want to get message digest by MD5 algorithm, instead of SHA, we can put MD5 here. So after we pick the algorithm here, we feed our data. The data is feeded into any cryptographic operation should be in binary format or what you call by terry. So strings are not accepted. So if you use a message string to be fed into the digest calculation, we have to convert this message string into the by terry. So then this by terry feed it into this update method. Then after that, we can call the digest method, it returns the hash in the binary format. So that's how we calculate in the hash. After that, in case of we want to verify those hash, in the verifier side, it has to do the same steps. So first of all, we need to get the instance of same algorithm. So after that, we need to update the data. So then we call the digest method. So it returns the hash value. So then what we should do, we should compare the new hash with the original hash. For that, we can use is equal method. So those is equal method will return true or false. 
If return true, that means hash is not changed. If return false, that means the message has. It's return true, that means message has not changed. If return false, that means message has changed. So that's how we write a simple program to calculate the hash and verify hash. I will show you a demo in a minute. So that's the end of this lecture. Let's see the uh, demo on how do you calculate and verify your hash values. So I will uh, share my terminal back to show that. Uh, so I, I will uh, use, uh, I will, maybe I accept this. Uh, and then I, I go to the directory where I'm going. I go to the directory called job. Okay. So there are several algorithms I have implemented, several Java programs. Some of these programs I will upload to my repository so then you can get access to those programs. Let me show you the simple hash calculation Java program. This is the program. So you see, in order to do this calculation, first of all, I have to import the Java security API. Then this is the message, hello, Fasun is the message which I want to use for hash calculation. So first of all, I need to get bytes out of this message. And then I get the instance of MD5 algorithm. Right, so this object is the implementation of message digest version 5 algorithm. So then I update the data, I get it here to the using update method and call the digest method, it returns me the hash values of this, uh, this message called hello person. So then uh, using these lines, I printed them on the screen. So let's say this is the verifier side. In the verifier, I receive this message. So then what I do, I get the same instance of the hashing algorithm here, and I update the data. I, I get the bytes out of this data, that is string. I get bytes out of that and update that to the update method and call the digest method. It returns me the new digest. So then what I should do is compare this old with the new. So for that, I use the is equal method here. You see, in SQL method, I compare new digest with original digest, and then it might get verified. Or it might say fail, right? Let me now go to the same directory uh, and compile and run this program. Like that. So I am in the same directory. I compile Java simple hash so it get compiled and then I run it like that you see it says here this is the original digest and this is new digest it say digest verified because both messages are same let me change the message so for example let's say I transmitted uh, this message here like that sorry like that with the dot, and somehow I receive the message without dot, right? So let me save that without dot. So then I compile it here back, the same program. Sorry, what I did. Uh, uh, did I do any mistake? String two. Uh, semicolon accepted in any I made a mistake. I have this hello person right uh, define my my update uh, to you, uh, okay, here you see, I put something here, so that was the wrong thing. Right, if this is verified, so that's fine. I 
save this program and then I compile it get compiled and then I run that so you see it say digest verification fail because so I transmit this uh, transmit this with the dot but I receive without dot these two different messages the digest verification fail these are the two uh, how this is the way to calculate the hash and verify the hash.